2018 was a pretty damn good year for video games. Lots of big releases like Red Dead, which I didn't play, Monster Hunter, which I didn't play, and Black Ops, which of course I didn't play. So, by process of elimination, what did I play and or love in 2018? Well, let's get right to it. Disclaimer though, you might not like some of these games, and that's okay. This is my list, so... Yeah, it's, it's, my, it's my list. Disclaimer number two. I decided to construct this video a bit differently. So for each game, I'm gonna put more focus on the one singular component that I enjoyed the most and made it stand out for me. Also, one last thing, there might be some minor spoilers of things like costumes and maybe some later levels. So if that stuff bothers you, don't say I didn't warn you. Oh, and final disclaimer, I hope you enjoy it. Hey, did you guys know I'm a child of the 90s? Yes! Yeah, oh, oh, okay, well, a huge part of the 90s for me was my ravenous hunger for just about every first person shooter being released at the time. I was obsessed with Wolfenstein, Doom, Blood, Shadow Warrior, Quake, Turok, etc. And this lasted up until Halo came out. Ever since then, shoot bangs became less and less my thing, as the subject matter for a lot of titles just wasn't hitting the dumb parts of my brain. But nowadays, thankfully, the cycle is repeating once more. That old design mentality when it comes to over-the-top settings, violence, and intricate level design was brought roaring back into the gaming subconscious when id released the Doom reboot with a back-to-basics approach, while still smattering it with modern conveniences. But if you prefer your FPS's with an even more back to basicer approach, then you can do no better than New Blood's Dusk. It is simply a gritty, grimy, lo-fi homage to those early 3D FPS's on the PC, and absolutely shreds in all the areas it needs to. Scary but simple monster designs, loads of fun weapons ranging from the expected to the absolutely bonkers. Power-ups, gore, secrets, Dusk is an old-school fan's blood-soaked dream come true. But like I stated, for this top 10, I want to focus on the biggest strengths of each game, and for Dusk, that would be the level design. One thing that made me fall out of love with FPS's in the early aughts were maps like this. Yeah, I always preferred multi-tiered dynamic levels you had to sort of suss out for yourself, with 3D Realms' Shadow Warrior being a great example of this, and Dusk takes that design philosophy to heart. You can start from a pitch black basement, work your way up through a house, to an attic, explore open farmlands and blast your way through a forest, all during the course of one single mission. The variety of environments spread across each episode also have their own sort of theme that helps them stand out, again, much like a lot of 90s shooters. Episode 1 is focused on rural horror, graveyards, cornfields, and cabins. Episode 2 has an abandoned military base sort of feel, and holy shit, Episode 3 is just straight up Cthulhu-inspired underground temples and dark abysses. Intricately designed maps are present in each and every episode, and not one level feels like a carbon copy of another. So, if you have fun areas to explore that are handcrafted to surprise and test the player, that's just half the job done right there. Throw in the smooth controls and an even smoother frame rate, and it's easy to see why Dusk is the most talked about indie FPS of 2018. If you are a horror or a shooter fan, I highly recommend you swing a rusty sickle in Dusk's direction. Awesome stuff, Dave. So let's talk about the polar opposite of Dusk, and that is Devolver Digital's Gris. Uh, Gris, Gris, I, I, I just... I, I can't believe that both these games are on the same list. Dusk and Gris, wow. Uh, so while you'd expect Devolver would be the one to publish a gory send-up of old-school shooters, they surprise me by putting out an absolutely jaw-dropping, evocative platformer that burns bright but brief. 
You play as a nameless female protagonist, and that's about all I'm really sure of. Gris World is a lush watercolor fantasy feast for the eyes, and while the story and motivations are merely hinted upon, your goal is pretty clear. Bring back the hues of nature to set everything right. You travel through six levels, gaining new abilities as you progress, with each one being fairly novel and fun to use. Our heroine can turn into a heavy block, perform a floaty double jump, and gain a swimming form that you'll need to use to outwit a dark force that stalks her for most of the adventure. And while it's not the most action-packed ride in the world, it does have some nail-biting moments as well as some incredibly serene locations of beauty for you to admire. But if I'm going to put forward what I think is Gris's best feature, it would have to be the gorgeous animation, as all of it is hand-drawn. The heroine's liquid-like dress contorts and moves with each and every new form she gains, while the looming presence that chases her is an even bigger reason for animation lovers to go, wow. The quality here also carries over to the few but impressive looking cutscenes, all the way down to the tiny creatures that populate the painting-like landscapes. Having gone through several years of education and art, I think I find this stuff maybe more impressive than someone who hasn't, but I think everyone can generally agree that this game is indeed that, art. 2D hand-drawn games in this style are becoming fewer and fewer, as people are receiving less and less instruction on the subject as time goes on. That's why the animation sticks out as such a defining feature. Would Cuphead have turned as many heads as it did if it was 3D? Probably not. And the same goes for Gris. The only real knock I can put on the game is its brevity. I finished it in maybe four hours, maybe a bit less, and while I expected it to be a short journey, I think it could have used one more world that forced the player to quickly use all the abilities they had gained up until that point. Still though, a remarkable adventure that might be divisive to some, but its visuals and animation will remain with me for a long, long time. The one word game titles continue, but this time with the magic of VR. Yeah, I'm, I'm not gonna lie here. I've been pretty cool on VR games since about their inception. The wow factor quickly faded for me and I just wasn't seeing any titles that really even justified being in VR or were anything beyond elaborate demos or experiences. That is until I was charmed, smitten, and wowed by the amazing and oh-so-cute world of Moss. Your time has come at last, dear reader. God, I, I just love this one. Now, Moss tells the story of Quill, an adventurous mouse that inhabits a world much like Watership Down or Wind in the Willows, that type of stuff. The threat here is a beast-ass fire-breathing snake named Saforg. Damn, that's that, that's that's a name. Yo, I'm gonna call you Saforg from now on, mother- Anyway, your uncle is kidnapped by Saforg's goons, and you have to go on a quest to save his ass. And that's the basic plot, but I'm not here to talk about the plot. A thing I want to single out here is Moss's use of VR itself. If you call yourself a VR trooper, you'll find that most games are played in the first person perspective. Shooters, action sports, hentai, booby wooby games, and the like. Moss is also in first person, but you are simply watching the game from that viewpoint, and you're controlling a character, in this case Quill, in the third person. See, your role in the game is being some type of celestial being who towers above the world of Moss, and while you manipulate Quill with your controller, you can look around freely and even use your godlike powers to move obstacles out of her way. You're basically playing co-op with yourself as you move your mousy warrior around, killing hostile creatures and making narrow jumps, while also pushing around blocks and bridging gaps. Bring that glass. And your sidekick too. You're going to need them. All of this wouldn't be nearly as novel or work as well if it wasn't in VR, as the head tracking allows you to get lower to look into the tiny cottages, water wheels, and see things from an angle you otherwise couldn't if this was played from a traditional third-person viewpoint. 
I hope I'm doing it justice here as this use of VR was a revelation to me and just proves as long as developers think outside the box and simply just don't fart out the 3,267th wave based zombie shooter, VR can provide some truly amazing experiences. Not to mention, Moss features charming voice acting, music, art design, and light, fun gameplay that's not especially difficult, but remains wholly enjoyable. It's over in about 5 hours, but it's gonna be some of the cutest, most goddamn magical hours of your life. If you need a reason to get into or get back into VR, you can do no better than Moss. <laughs> Ninjas. Ninjas are animals. Ninjas like to fight all the time, whether they're using their bio slime, rocking on guitars with their massive boners, or deftly defying gravity with cloud stepping, you always know you're going to be in for a good time. This principle remains true in Sabotage QC's The Messenger, a title I first got to play at PAX East almost a year ago and have since fallen in love with. Hard. Not since Shovel Knight did I feel such a sense of authenticity, polish, and love for the source material as what's on display here. Because at its core, The Messenger is a love letter, Ninja Gaiden, Wrath of the Black Manta, Metroid, Castlevania, and hell, just about everything classic you can think of while still having lots of great ideas of its own. In fact, I think no one component of the messenger is overwhelmingly its defining trait as it has some fun, witty dialogue, satisfying and challenging platforming, and a meaty quest you can really sink your teeth into. However, there is one aspect I decide to spend more time on. Peel your ears back and listen. Yeah, I want to talk about just how fantastic the Messenger's audio soundscape is. Just off the bat, amazing, catchy compositions that harken back to the 8-bit era that, you know, while not to disparage OSTs of other games, is just simply a cut above the rest. Then there's the little audio details, like the music becoming muffled when you're underwater, a trick I remember from Mario Galaxy, but this might be the first 2D game I've ever seen to implement it. The satisfying sounds of hits, explosions, and fanfares when defeating a boss. Hell, even the sound of dying is entertaining. There's so many extra steps the developers didn't need to take. Usually, if you're trying to invoke certain eras or motifs, you can put all your energy into the visual design and just call it a day. People would be happy with just that. But with the messenger, Sabotage decided to put all their energy into the visuals and the audio across two different time periods. So, you know, just to be clear, the big thing with the messenger is that you are constantly warping between the past and the future, sometimes within seconds of each other. The catchy 8-bit tunes will then suddenly switch to a punchier 16-bit version in time with that transition. It's, it's an audio orgasm to say the least. Both the future and the past versions of the Messenger OST are equally awesome, so no matter what time period or level you're in, your ears are going to thank you regardless. Not to mention the surprisingly deep and layered story, teeming with multiple memorable characters, the sublime and pixel perfect platforming, all of this stuff is essential to the Messenger's magical recipe. However, I just still feel the music is something that threads it all together. If you consider yourself a fan of older franchises from the 8-bit or 16-bit eras, you'll find something that'll make you smile and nod wistfully with the messenger. Now, one of the only games in this list that can stand shoulder to shoulder with the Messenger's soundtrack is of course the next one I want to talk about. The thoughtful, introspective, charming, hardcore, hard as nails Twitch platformer, Celeste. Coming to us from Matt Makes Games, no relation, Celeste frames its nail-biting and one-hit death gameplay with the story of Madeline, a plucky but unconfident girl struggling with something I and many others can relate to, anxiety. She has decided to try and overcome these self-doubts while climbing Celeste Mountain, a Herculean task most people wouldn't even attempt. 
She feels this is something she needs to do and that'll hopefully help her in some way, even if she's not exactly sure why. So while I could talk about the amazing pixel work, the master class OST, or the razor sharp precision of its controls, let's talk about Celeste's themes. Immediately upon arriving at the base of the mountain, a crotchety old woman advises to Madeline she should just quit now, and that Celeste Mountain is a place that changes people. Undaunted, and assuming she's just a crazy old cat woman, Madeline pushes on. She soon comes across the incredibly likable Theo, a fellow traveler who hails from the far off land of Seattle, and suffers from a serious case of wanderlust. Theo is earnest, warm, and encourages our heroine throughout her adventure and becomes her friend for life. The other main character I wanted to mention is Battleline, the magically spawned doppelganger of Maddie who is composed of all her fears, worries, and stressors. Battleline is the main antagonist that will show up at all the worst times to ruin your day and will constantly tell Madeline that she'll fail. And fail you will as the muscle memory platformer gameplay is indeed punishing at times. You'll explore magical caves, deserted mountain hotels, parallel dimensions, and all these thematic elements or characters are used just at the right time. Not one level feels the exact same as there will be some new type of gimmick that keeps it feeling fresh, and the rotation of characters that the game focuses on for each chapter is also pretty varied. One particularly important scene happens with a gondola ride that Madeline and Theo need to take to progress. Madeline suffers a sudden panic attack, and Theo introduces a subtle bit of gameplay on how to deal with such an attack. Having gone through a few of these in my life, I thought this moment was handled incredibly well and is going to stay with me for a while. The game wraps up with a thrilling conclusion that simply escalates in emotions with every step Madeline takes closer to the summit. Even though the gameplay is so simple and you're just basically moving up the entire time, you always have your reason for doing so, which is a great driving force. And again, that's still discounting all the other things the game has to offer, especially when it comes to replay value. Celeste presents lots of unlockable bonus levels that don't mess around, even more collectibles, and lets you customize a series of rules that can make the game easier or harder depending on your preference. In terms of pure platforming, it's in a league of its own, but its narrative themes, definitely tackling subject matter few games would attempt to, is what makes Celeste stand out and shine. Now, as a Smash veteran, I've put thousands of hours into Smash 64. Seriously though, while I did indeed play the first two entries in the series the most, and considerably dropped off after that, smashing is something I'm always down for. Mm. Okay. Regardless, I don't think Ultimate needs much of an introduction, but I did want to preface this. Upon its big E3 reveal, I wasn't particularly hyped for it. I put the least amount of time into Smash 4, and leading up to the C3, I assumed it was just going to be a simple port, like, you know, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. I'm sorry, Matt. But over the course of several directs, I was consistently more and more impressed with all the little changes, additions, and characters Nintendo was just heaping onto the character pile. The whole everyone is here mantra they stood by really actually started to feel like it. This indeed was the ultimate version of Super Smash Bros. This is also when I got fully on board. The thing I think most people can agree upon about modern Smash Bros. is what I'll be detailing here. Content. Unlike a lot of other fighting game series that put out basic, underwhelming versions of their games and charge full price for them, only to just slowly build on it for years later, Smash always comes to drunkenly party straight out the gate. I'm talking about Spirit Mode, World of Light, Classic Ladders, Unlockables minigames, almost every single stage, Omega variations of those stages, and every goddamn character from fiction. Sure, there's gonna be DLC fighters, but in this day and age, you know, that you gotta expect that. 
And again, unlike some other series, the DLC characters in Smash are treated as they should be, which is being worth the money. Each one coming with their own stage, all their colors slash costumes, and their associated music tracks. This is how you do fighting game DLC. This franchise has come such a long way since the Smash 64 days, and yes, that was an experimental game at first. Only had a few unlockables, but it had endless amounts of fun. The way that every Smash title keeps one-upping the last one in terms of content is a very rare thing in the industry, and each time people get rehyped once more. You know, even if they always result in complaining about the game at the tail end of its life. I'm not complaining though. They got they got fucking K rule in here. I'm I'm good. I'm fine with that. If you have a Switch, you probably already like if not love Smash Ultimate. And yeah, its online options are not the most robust. World of Light is still not as good as Subspace Emissary, but you know, sex isn't as good as Subspace Emissary. An essential party slash fighting game if you're a Nintendo or, you know, Square, or Konami, or Sega, or Capcom fan, Smash is one of the best values for money you can get in 2018. Now, remember when I said that crazy thing in my Darksiders 3 review where I crazily said it was a game of the year for me? Well, I wasn't as much of a crazy liar as you all thought I was, because here it is at number 4. If you want more details about why I liked Fury's redemption arc so much, go watch that review right now, or or th then come back here and, and or see it later when this is done. Anyway, long story short, this game just clicked for me, despite you know all its technical problems at launch. If someone says I'm weird or you know I smell for liking this game, I'd be like, yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe. I'm beginning to enjoy the sound of your voice, Watcher. Okay, so Darksiders 3. The thing I was most impressed with was the combat, as it really navigated this narrow line of simplifying it from the previous two games in the series, while still making it immensely satisfying and visceral. Like I previously outlined, its tempo is a bit more like a Souls game, a bit more methodical as you lock on to usually just one or two enemies at a time, dodge their attacks, and then counterattack. But keeping in line with the previous Darksiders games, there's no stamina governing all these actions. However, healing yourself conversely works pretty much like any From Software title. This mixture of more traditional third-person action game animations and attacks blended with the speed and movement options of a Souls game is what makes the combat system just so memorable to me. The game only has about six main weapons, and that's way less than what Death had at his disposal, and of course that's dwarfed even more by the arsenals in a lot of Souls games as well, so it's quite a handicap to limit the weapon number that much. However, the hollow forms, coupled with the weapons, layering in the arcane counters, it all works symbiotically to provide thrilling, satisfying battles I almost never got tired of. Additionally, if you were to play the game now, you'd be welcomed with a new screen that allows you to change the combat from this style to something a bit more akin to Darksiders games of the past. Heals now instantly give you back your HP with no additional animations, and the bread and butter of your defensive options, the counters, have been improved. You can now dodge out of pretty much all your basic attack strings, making it a bit easier for newcomers and those that prefer looser, more forgivable timing. With this update to the game, you can now pick between both styles, so you know it's up to you as to what you'd prefer. There's always a choice, darling. Again, I go into more detail in my review, but I'll take a second here to say that I'm so happy I was able to give this game a second chance after being, you know, pretty frosty on it since its reveal. It's just a reminder that media, yeah, can sometimes still surprise you even if you had your mind made up initially. At the moment, I've had enough surprises. <laughs> Ooh, if there ever was a series I thought I couldn't lose any more interest in, especially one that I had previously loved, it would have to be God of War. 
The first two titles on the PS2 are some of my favorite games on that system, but each subsequent release bored me further and further until I just didn't care anymore. I put about 30 minutes into Ascension, remember that one? The third prequel game? And never even touched Chains of Olympus, so, you know, yeah, I, w I was fully checked out. Good enough. All it took for Sony Santa Monica to get me fully checked back in was an idea that I, and many others, had thought of upon finishing God of War 3. Let's, uh, let's move on. Um, yeah, new location. Let's, let's just slaughter another Pantheon somewhere else. And maybe we can get a new character in there. Cause goddamn, I was sick of Kratos. They listened. Santa Monica moved us to the frozen landscape of Nordic mythology. And while they didn't dump the ghost of Sparta, I think it was the right choice overall to focus on him at least one more time. In terms of the core game, it's a startling departure from all the rest of them, featuring completely new combat systems, progression, story. It was just a massive overhaul, which is what the series was begging for. What I'll be paying special attention to here, however, is what you are seeing right now, the graphics. I think nowadays it takes ludicrous levels of graphical fidelity to wow people anymore because a lot of AAA games already look amazing. However, God of War's visuals made me pause. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I ended up in this situation. Like, how, how did they do that? How did they render this incredibly choreographed fight scene or put together the world serpent? How is this frame rate holding up during this section? How can there be so many goddamn pretty particle effects everywhere? That's not to say I didn't marvel the sheer beauty that was the art design of the game, especially areas like Freya's glade and even the forest outside of Kratos' sad dad cabin. That same visual detail extends to the characters themselves, and while some titles are still skirting the uncanny valley, I think God of War leaps across that line to provide compelling characters whose emotions shine through all the polygons and textures. Only fire! Only fire when I tell you to fire. Kratos, I feel, is the best example of this due to his lack of visible emotion. Incredibly subtle facial animation was able to express a whole lot of things on his face as he grappled with the consequences of his and Atreus's quest. Further proof that advancements in technology can sure make something you thought was old and busted feel fresh and interesting again. Aside from all that, there's also the incredible writing, soundtrack, voice acting, and the axe being a worthy successor to the Blades of Chaos. Damn, there's a lot to like in this one. Yeah, the game kind of meanders around in the middle portion, and I, you know, I could have done with a few more boss fights, maybe lessen the amount of mindless waves you had to take on, but I'm, I'm picking some nits here. Because with all that said, this latest entry in the franchise does prove that you can teach an old god new tricks. Ugh, that's, that's, is that the best I could do? So, care to try again? Why do I never get the easy jobs? Who knows? <laughs> Okay, you want to sex up dudes, smoosh down some girls, cuddle up with both, talk philosophy, or fight crazy mythological beasts? Allow me to introduce you to the fun, hedonistic wonder of Assassin's Creed Malacus. Now, much like God of War, I stopped not caring a very large amount about the series after AC Black Flag. I skipped Rogue, Liberation, Syndicate, the the French one, and oh, I, I also watched about 27 minutes of the movie before I just tapped out, and I never tap out of movies. Anyway, fast forward a little bit, Origins was the game that brought me back into the Assassin's Fold, and while I liked it and put in over 20 hours, I never wound up finishing it. It came out at the same time as Mario Odyssey, and the story wasn't really super grabbing me, so I did wind up shelving it in the end. However, I did love all the changes to the formula, and AC Odyssey, on the other hand, instantly captured me due to its time period. 
ancient Greece is still an area I have a lot of love for, and while I felt the Pegasus had been very beaten to death by Sony Santa Monica, I was excited to see it through the open world lens of Ubisoft, and specifically Ubisoft Quebec. They had started development of this game after Origins and were able to take a lot of the feedback people had from that game and use it to improve their own. So with that in mind, I feel the strongest element of Odyssey is the setting itself. The Grecian Islands is an area rife to explore and unlike older God of Wars, which only highlighted a few major locations with a lot of them being fantasy based, Malakas lets you go to Athens, Crete, Macedonia, Sparta, and the most obscure island of them all, etc. Now, a lot of these locations have their own customs, industries, and namesakes. For example, Crete is all about the Minotaur, so people are always trying to hustle you to buy their merch. You know, it's so annoying. There's an island that specializes in catching octopus, so there's a lot of zone archives just splayed onto the beaches there. As your Alexios or Cassandra make their landfall on each island, there'll usually be a few introductory missions that flesh out what that town is all about. I can escort your son to the camp master. Good. He'll learn how to be a man like his father and brother, or he'll die trying. Someone will point to a particular building, statue, or effigy that's considered the cornerstone of that island, giving each location their own importance and identity. Aside from that, you'll find mysterious mist-covered landmasses off the beaten track, or off the ocean waves, and you'll come across pirate coves, a literal battle world, sunken ruins, the sheer amount of new places you'll come across is just staggering. There's a constant flow of variety here and a sense of surprise and discovery that I hadn't felt since Wind Waker. But of course, compared to a Zelda, Odyssey has far more to do and, of course, have sex with. I also can't discount the incredibly detailed graphics, the wonderful cast of characters, the meaty combat and skill distribution, armor customization, and of course the intriguing plot. All of these components kept me and Crime Tina glued to the screen. We spent over 80 hours in Ancient Greece, and I didn't even do every major side quest, although I did complete all the main story threads, which is a rare thing for me in open world games, and that's a huge amount of praise. If you are into big, expansive, third person open world titles, then, you know, don't be a Malacca. Get on a boat and experience the lush world of Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So, yeah, are you surprised? I already made a few videos on Insomniac's superhero magnum opus, so y'all could have just guessed it was going to be my favorite superhero game of all time, and of course, my game of the year in general. You know, Spidey has had a banger of a 2018, and this is one of the things that really propped him up, although not as highly as Spider-Verse in my eyes. I didn't know you were a fan. But hey, we're here to talk about video games. So, you know, unlike, say, Darksiders 3, I had a lot of faith in this project since day one, as it just seemed like it was going to be a slam dunk and a franchise that Sony really wanted to flex. While I always thought Sucker Punch would have been the more appropriate developer to handle the old webhead, Insomniac managed to blow me and my already high expectations out of the water. The story, characters, writing, voice acting, gameplay, it, it just sets a new standard for licensed IPs in just about every way, especially for a superhero whose games had kind of been languishing for a few years. I'm going to die. In my Spider-Man video essay about why I thought it worked, I talked a lot about the themes and the story, but now... Let's focus on the locomotion. I think the feature, a PS4 man that sets it apart from similar 2018 titles like God of War or Assassin's Creed is in its movement. Web slinging is basically perfected here in that it really lets you choose how active you want to be. Yes, you can just casually hold R2 and go in that direction, but more advanced maneuvers like the jump fault and exploding off the lips of buildings after running up alongside them really show that you can tear some spider ass across the city if you so choose. 
The fact you can pinpoint the exact spot you want to land on, talk to some NPCs, beat up some bad guys who are over there, start running throughout a web line, and be right on your way in seconds is just so smooth and polished. It's, it's hard to find any fault in it. Even Spider-Man 2 and some later titles were a bit unwieldy if you wanted to be precise. I need to jump to that precise building. Oh, I overshot it up. That doesn't really happen in Spider-Man PS4. And of course, it's also a slight cut above the PC version. Of <laughs> when you are trying to remain faithful to an established character, you have to leverage the things that make them memorable and unique and then emphasize those qualities as best you can. Spider-Man PS4 does this to an almost flawless degree, with web swinging being the common factor that just ties everything together. Just getting from place to place is fun in and of itself, which is something that all the other games on my list don't quite achieve. Anyway, in a time where we desperately need heroes to inspire or just simply entertain us, Spider-Man is my top pick for game of the year and the finest piece of software I played in 2018. All right, lesson's over. Gotta go. Hey, uh, thanks. You know, anytime. If you want to tell me how wrong my list is or, you know, preferably just want to suggest any other top 10 lists I can do in the future, let me know in the comments below or shoot a ropey stream of spider goo at mattmuscles at gmail.com. Thanks for watching everybody and I hope you'll be on the lookout for my next list, The Bad Game.